start, before I begin, I'd like to express uh, my uh, gratitude for the organizers of uh, uh, our conference for gathering us here. I learned uh, some, uh, very important things during uh, these two days. Uh, very important questions were posed and very um, important issues were raised and, and uh, discussed. Uh, I'm also very grateful for uh, invitation and for the opportunity to share some general thoughts on the relationship between 1956 and uh, culture and art. Um, uh, but I uh, won't uh, be talking about uh, literature where the impact of 1956 was, uh, was huge, but rather because I am an art historian, but rather about uh, uh, visual arts and about uh, film. Um, the title uh, of my presentation, you can see here, Farewell to Myth, Waiting for uh, Myth. Oops. Just a second. Here, and on the occasion of this particular anniversary, I probably don't need to remember you the famous, the famous water polo match at the Melbourne Olympics in 1956 when the, uh, when the Hungarian team had one of the most dramatic experiences in their career. Certainly, it was not only about sport. At the time and now, to everything was symbolic, and the yielding attitude of the Hungarians the brutality of the Soviet team, uh, blood from the Erwin Zador's super, uh, superciliary arch flowing down his cheek, the audience supporting the Hungarians and hating the Soviets, and finally, the triumphant victory of the former 4 to 0. Still, in Poland, that episode and the famous photography of bleeding Zador would have probably been totally forgotten if not for Christina Goda's film, Children of Glory, this is uh, English title, uh, uh, of the film, shown in Polish movie theaters only for a brief period of time. Uh, don't we all need such moments which contribute to our individual and collective memory and identity? I have come to this meeting from Poznań when during the first month of 1980, when solidarity was in, in full bloom, a monument with the date 1956 was erected to commemorate the protest of workers and the ensuing skirmishes of the people with the secret service, police, and the military, sometimes called the Second Wielkopolska Uprising. The monument, located in the one of the central squares of the city, consists of two crosses connected by a common horizontal beam and a piece of thick rope which symbolizes community and mutual support with reference to the Christian tradition. After 1989, a vertical sequence of historic Polish years of protest, 1956, 1968, 1970, 1976, 1980, was supplemented with 1981, when the martial law was imposed on Poland and the description for liberty, law, and bread was completed with God at the beginning. Some local intellectuals and artists were not quite happy with the monument, since they believed that it uh, expressed a national Catholic ideology which, in their opinion, was as oppressive as the communist one and as dangerous for democracy. Adam Gracik design was criticized in comparison with that of Anna and Christian Jarnuszkiewicz uh, without a conventional vertical dominant who won the uh, uh, official uh, uh, 
official competition. The symbolism of their design did not include any national or, or religious elements, but subtle metaphors of construction, enshrining, and social memory. At any rate, at that time, ni uh, 1956, was in Poznan a crucial point of reference for ideas and practice of uh, social resistance, an indispensable element of identity and the sense of community of societies and peoples united against by uh, the oppression of the U USSR. It provided figures of memory, such as the images of fighting in Poznan or Budapest, and the names of Roman, Romek Strzałkowski and Peter Mansfeld, the fallen, let's say, gavroshes of the Polish and Hungarian revolutions. I was born in 1959, the year which many scholars consider to mark the end of the political thaw after 1956. I remember, of course, the reality of communism by my formative experience was the period of solidarity and the martial law, which is why I associate the Poznań monument not so much with tanks, a crowd of people in front of the university, and the noise of shooting near the Secret Service building in June 1956, but rather with the winter of 1982, when we, my friends and myself, were running away from the approaching riot police special forces, so-called ZOMO, which didn't want to let us light candles before the crosses on February 13th, uh, 1992. The heritage of uh, 1956 was important to us, yet the ensuing thaw was not our time, so that now I, that, uh, now I can ask a few embarrassing questions. Before I do it, though, it is necessary to explain why the title of my short presentation includes the word myth, which may be, may be interpreted in different ways. Indeed, it is my intention to connect it to the names of Roland Barth and Joseph Campbell, who defined it differently. According to Barth, myth is a kind of whale imposed on reality and an instrument of detachment which is a result of social process, at times consciously, uh, consciously used to impose meaning on signs, text, and images. In such a context, the scholar is an independent analyst, a destroyer of myth, who wants to share his or her skepticism with the audience. According to Campbell, what is at stake is not the myth truth value, but its role in human life and culture, or perhaps with its truthfulness located at a different level. Campbell, inspired by Jung, approached myth both as an instrument of self-knowledge uh, self reaching to the regenerating archetypes and the substance of the nomos, or sacred canopy, which protects us from nothingness, from the sense of the world's absurdity and contingency. I quote, uh, I quote uh, Campbell, on the most general level, myth expressed the idea of the ultimate order which establishes relations among the concepts important to a given community by classifying them in hierarchical systems. The end of the quote. Consequently, we may briefly claim that in Barth's view, myths are, myths are obstacles on the way to knowledge why Campbell believes that they make its frame and support the process of identity building. In my opinion, the significance of 1950, uh, 1956 in today's culture is actually mythical in both ways. Taking the role of the critical analyst of myth proposed by Barth, I will start with the myth of artistic modernism to an extent characteristic of the whole East Central Europe. One of the most important feature of, uh, features of this myth is to approach the historical reality in binary terms whose elements are supposed to be coherent and uniform. On the one hand, uh, on the one hand there is the power system designated by the Soviets. On the other, the host of artists who preferred the culture of Western Europe a, and ideologically and politically opposed the regime. Allegedly, the latter was for ideological reasons supporting the socialist realism, which means that the accepted model of art 
was concomitant with the ideology, the foundation of the institutional and political power. On the other, this particular myth is based on a belief that as a result of historical conflict, the binary system forced the, the, the uh, authorities to allow for more and more freedom of creation and to accept modernist art as an element of the visual sphere. Supporting modernism was a weapon used in this conflict, which means, as Inji Chalupetsky, a Czech uh, art critic, wrote, that is, uh, that it articulated resistance to the communist regime with the main role of the autonomous values of art opposed to its propaganda use. In terms of that myth, the return to the socialist realism, for instance, in Poland after 1956, uh, was uh, impossible since the authorities, uh, I quote again, uh, started respecting reality, which means that they had to make some concessions because culture kept developing and reluctantly accept some degree of artistic freedom. Besides, those concessions were connected with new, less violent form of uh, surveillance, direct uh, ideological pressure sanctioned by death or prison sentences changed into more flexible economic and institutional control of the strictly demarcated cultural field. Moreover, modernism was accepted in as much as it legitimized the regime abroad as more or less uh, enlightened, uh, as more or less enlightened. Still, regardless of different timing of modernism in the countries of the Soviet zone, according to the myth, manifestation must be interpreted as acts of political resistance to communist power, which endorsed the artistic values of Europe against the Soviet dictatorship and culture. From such a point of view, the artistic endorsement of modernism art must be understood today as an essentially moral gesture, protest against restrictions imposed on artistic freedom by the pro-Soviet authorities. Certainly, even as a myth destroyer, I cannot deny, referring to the Polish example, that after 1956, art radically changed and it could be seen at first sight. Oops. Uh, more or less stylized socialist realism was largely replaced by abstraction and painting of, uh, and painting of the matter. The pre-World II tradition of Polish modernism was continued while post-impressionism, considered by many artists and critics to represent the mainstream of European painting, returned to the top of the artistic hierarchy. At the same time, film directors such as Vajda, Munk, Haas, and Kavalerowicz founded so-called Polish school. Their films told stories on previously forbidden topics of, for example, the 1944 Warsaw Uprising, the 1939 September campaign, and the fighters of the post-war anti-communist guerrilla. And yet, when, we, when one takes a closer look, the reconstructed myth begins to crumble. The destroyer of myth would argue that the modernization of art was largely undertaken by the former socialist realists. The Polish informal paintings had little to do with the French negation of culture as such with muddy and scatological associations, and their meanings remained close to the socialist realist idiom as analogs of scientific research, effects of analyzing modern life stimulated by technological process, progress. Similarly, the films of Polish directors did nearly challenge the official ideology of the communist state. The fighters of anti-communist guerrilla were in uh, those films of a false idea of honor and ideological manipulations of their superiors. The 1939 defeat resulted from mindless wasting of the soldiers' lives, while the tragedy of the Warsaw Uprising was caused by the refusal to treat the Soviet troops waiting on the other side of Vistula as allies. 
But analyzing the connection of the 1956 watershed and the evolution of culture, the Miss Destroyer must try to delve deeper in the relationship of art and politics at that time. She or he should probably change the perspective and abandon the modernist, idea, modernist ideas concerning art in favor of a more distance approach critical of heroic narratives. One probably must start from the level of global politics, remembering that from the death of Stalin in 1953 till the end of the decade, his successors were fighting for power. In fact, it was Khrushchev's struggle for domination with the changing alliances of his enemies and temporary supporters. Sometimes both parties made, made risky moves, for instance, when in 1957 Khrushchev's opponents almost managed to push him aside, but quite often the effects of those moves were unpredictable, uh, unpredictable since particular members of the collective leadership did not, uh, did not have a full picture of the situation. The famous, uh, the famous uh, Khrushchev's secret speech at the 20th uh, uh, Communist Party Congress was such a move. It acquitted the speaker and others of the charge of complicity, still he hesitated how far to go with his criticism of Stalin. He was not sure whether to make the speech classified for fear of turmoil in the satellite countries or perhaps publicize it to some extent. In some cases, the turmoil took rather unexpected forms. Among the 1956 protests, the one of the earliest took place in Tbilisi. More than 60,000 people protested for four days, and then when the crowd stormed the local radio station, the, mili the military intervened, 20 pr protesters died, 60 were wounded, and several hundred arrested. The crowd wanted Georgia to leave the, uh, the, U, uh, the USSR, but in fact it was a riot against Khrushchev's speech and the defamation of Stalin's name. Tens of thousands put flowers under the uh, dictator's uh, statue while hundreds cruised over the, uh, all over the city with his portraits shouting, down with Khrushchev, Molotov for prime minister, Molotov for the general secretary. From such point of view, 1956 can be referred to as a result of ongoing conflicts among the members of the collective Soviet le leadership, which in different ways were attempted to put under control. Khrushchev enjoyed a temporary victory over so-called anti-party group, sending Molotov, as we know, with a diplomatic mission to Mongolia, and Malenkov to northern Kazakhstan as the manager of a power station. The inner conflicts in the satellite countries brought about the different effects depending on the local uh, alliances and the support of part particular fighters from Moscow, as well as on the current goals in international politics chaotically pursued by the collective leadership. The chaos was caused by the inner imbalance and sometimes by the incompetence of, uh, incompetence of Khrushchev, Bulganin, or Kaganovich. Next to com competing with the USA and relations with Western Europe, two issues were important. First, Khrushchev wanted to settle the relations with Yugoslavia, which was the question of his personal ambition, and feared that the Yugoslav version of national communism might spread disorder in the Soviet influence zone. However, mutual visits in 1955 and, uh, five and 1956, in June uh, 1956, Tito came to Moscow, did not bring any results, and a failure in negotiations with Tito contributed probably to the to the decision to attack Hungary in November that year. Second, Khrushchev was also failed to win the favors of Mao, which influenced the Soviet tactics in dealing with Poland and Hungary. Approaching the political significance of 1956 from the local internal points of view of the countries reacting to dwindling Soviet control, one realizes a very important duality. In order to illustrate that duality, Piotr Semka author of recently, uh, recently published mo monumental history of anti-communist emotions, makes a reference to a scene from Richard Bugajski film, Interrogation, which finished in 1982, had to wait for seven years to make it to movie theaters. The female uh, protagonist, released from the Stalinist prison, turns his face to sunshine, and at the moment she is bumped into by a passing girl wearing fashionable clothes, 
who look at her as she had been a loony hag. Simka, uh, Semka draws his reader's attention to gap between the generation of 1935, 1940, and that released from Stalinist prison, prisons. The young generation, which did know too much about the recent, uh, recent past, also for safety reasons, was open to Western culture and followed uh, new social trends, while its political opinions were formed by years of ideolog uh, ideological uh, indoctrination. The riots of 1956, particularly those of October, were often led by young Marxists. Semka believes that this is the only way to interpret the legend of uh, Poprostu, the Polish weekly of the young intelligentsia, which did not think about struggling for in, uh, independence, but about reforming socialism. The former prisoners found it hard to accept that the new leaders were former Stalinists, such as Władysław Gomułka, who was the Communist Party leader during the reign of terror uh, directed against the home Alme soldiers, often continuing their fighting in the anti-communist underground. The party revisionists who took control over the uh, October events in Poland did not want uh, radical de-Stalinization since they would have to be de-Stalinized uh, uh, themselves. On the other hand, the dynamic of the June skirmishes in Poznań and demonstration in other regions of Poland was transformed by social energy into a popular anti-Soviet national revolution demanding also right to worship God. The crumbling wall of fear made the people want the truth about cutting the return of the Eastern territories incorporated in the USSR, dismissing Russian officers from the Polish army, political independence, and release of Cardinal Stanisław Wyszyński, the primate, after more than three years spent in detention. Even though Poland did not experience what happened in Hungary where the pre-war parties were uh, restored and the people postulated abandoning the Warsaw Pact, uh, the actual duality was distinct. The anti-Soviet national and religious turmoil was ignored by its activists who were thinking in terms of revision of the socialist dogma. It was, writes Semka, quoting Wiesław Chrzanowski, a drama of a society without its elites, since their members were either dead, killed in combat on, or in prisons, or under strict surveillance, they could not become active in politics again. Thus, they were replaced by the Marxists who became leaders of the revolution, changing its course. Obviously, at the time, culture was related to internal politics and remained dependent on global politics as well. An attempt to ignore it brought about a tragedy in Hungary, why Poland did not dare to make it. Under such circumstances, the myth, myth destroyer may argue to replace the, the dominant myth of modernism with an alternative account different from the interpretation of modern art after 1956 as a morally and politically significant activity, which uh, effectively opposed the totalitarian regime and forced it to increase the degree of artistic freedom. The myth destroyer would rather claim that in the context of the duality I've just discussed, in 1956, the leading revisionist or former Stalinist arranged their relations with the world of art to make them match the, the, the dynamic of the particular moment of the social turmoil so that they would not put in danger their own position of revolutionary leaders. So that's why both then and now there have no been references to the national and popular uprising since that would violate the internal and external consensus. In conclusion, the myth destroyer would postulate to abandon the still valid modernist myth and revise it in terms of today's scholarly research and contemporary artistic activity. For the time being though, such appeals don't bring any notable results. Our students still learn that each and every modern artist by definition was an opponent of the totalitarian state while art was an instrument of resistance, regardless of many historical instances which subvert this heroic narrative. Elevating artistic values and highly appreciating the world of art, the modernist myth generated a substitute field of activity where, uh, where artistic acts replaced everyday life, changing the field of art into that of ambiguous compromise. 
What is then the most dangerous for the believers of this myth I've tried to describe is the loss of the former, I mean the loss of the uh, field of art uh, with its potential, instruments, and means, of, and means of expression, which means that the most important task is in general to prevent that loss, for instance, through compromise justified by the benefit of art. In this case, the boundary of 1956 has become a crucial element uh, uh, of a whole historiographic model, which is the core of a narrative related to the mythologized assumptions and identity needs rooted in the desire to imagine a conflict between artistic modernity and the totalitarian communist state. Perhaps by showing the tension between the myth and the modernist art and the complex character of the historical event, which, is had, which has been blurred by the former, I've managed to shed some light on the reasons why a Campbellian version of the myth of 1956 as the founding myth of the democratic societies and states of Poland, Hungary, and other countries of East Central Europe does not seem to be promoted, let's say, very much now. To my knowledge, it is not a topic endorsed by modern art and contemporary art, and after 1989, it has been rarely taken up by cinema. I've already mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, Christina Goda's film. Another one is the uh, 2004 biography of Imre Noc by Marta Metharos. Even against this uh, background, Polish cinema offers next to nothing to discuss. In 1996, uh, Philip Bayon made a small scale film, Poznań 56 showing the June, June protest and the skirmishes of the Poznan workers with the police and the military. Besides, there are some traces of uh, 1956 in other films, Bugajski Interrogation and Krzysztof Kieślowski Blind Chance, in which the protagonist, symbolically born in 1956, in 1968 says, says goodbye to his Jewish friend who leaves Poland and in 1981 dies in a plane crash. Most likely one could find more such traces both in Polish and Hungarian cinema, but this does not change the fact that the attempts to tell the story of the 1956 are few. There are some documentary film, films, of course. No doubt it's a pity since both for Hungary and for Poland as well for other countries of the region 1956 would make an origin of many identity myths and figures of remembrance supplying the social historical memory with exemplars of virtue. It may be that, paradoxically, one of the obstacles to the desirable exploitation and proliferation of the, of the Campbellian idea of myth and the proper system of values in is inadequate work on myth, which by revealing the historical complexity of 1956 should provoke a debate about relations among various political aspects of the course of events at that time. Global politics with the interest of the superpowers at stake, internal politics with its space for rivalry in the party elites, and among factions trying to use the revolutionary mood and activity for their own purposes, and the outbreak of national and popular uprisings. In such a historical context, the arts and other fields of cultural production could also make more profound insights into their roles back then. Myth understood in the Campbellian way could foster such an enlightening discussion. Yet, what seems to be a necessary condition to start this discussion is more comprehensive, I think, critique of the Barthesian mono-myth. Thank you very much for your attention.